sorry, MHPM would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on the land, seas and waterways across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay our respects to the elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the cultures and the hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. So I'm Nicola Palfrey and I'm a clinical psychologist and I'm your host for this evening. Uh, we have an exciting panel for you. It should be very interesting and, and introduce a whole lot of topics that uh, are new to you and also some really interesting conversations. So we've sent through the panellists' bios before tonight, so we won't necessarily go through them again because we want to have enough time to get through their content and also to answer questions that come through for you tonight. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Dr. Helen Stanley and ask her an introductory question for this evening. So Helen, welcome to the webinar. Nice to see you this evening. I wanted to start, Thank you, Helen. Nicola. You're a GP uh, in a rural area, and I was wondering if you think that it could be more difficult to address the prevention of heart disease for people living with mental illness in rural areas. Uh, thank you, thank you, Nicola. In, in my opinion, it, it can be more difficult to to prevent heart disease for people living in rural areas because rural areas have a much higher rate of heart disease to start to start off with, and and also we we lack some members of the team. We have a shortage of health professionals as well, and we we're also going through a drought at the moment. So we've also got a lot of people who are who are facing not only geographical barriers but also financial barriers in rural Australia as well. Thank yeah. you. Thanks Helen. Um, and I've just been told we have 483 people online right now so welcome everybody. That's very exciting turnout. Um, next I'd like to introduce Dr Philip Tully, a psychologist from South Australia. And Phil, we've been chatting about some of the research that you've been doing in Europe and I was wondering if you did notice any differences in the area of prevention for people living with mental illness and heart disease uh, in Europe compared to in Australia. Yeah, hi Nicola, thanks. Uh, I think for primary prevention there's good guidelines in place and assuming people are adhering to them that the cardiometabolic monitoring in bipolar is pretty consistent. However, I think there are differences in secondary prevention. Um, certain um, jurisdictions such as Germany are better equipped to deal with mental health um, in people with established heart disease such as having a heart attack or heart failure. Um, so I think the main difference is in secondary prevention. Okay, great. Thank you, Phil. And finally, but certainly not least, we have uh, Associate Professor David Calhoun joining us from Queensland, who's a cardiologist. Now, David, my question to you is, you recently presented at the Australian Atherosclerosis, I hope I got that correct, Society Clinical Meeting, and you were talking about the PREDIMED diet. Could you just give us a brief intro to what the PREDIMED diet is, please? Yes, the, the, yes, PREDIMED, the, the PREDIMED diet, diet is, a is a diet based, based on the based classic on the Mediterranean, Mediterranean diet as first described in 1952 by Anthony. It's a diet with the key elements we believe of the, of the uh, Mediterranean, Mediterranean region. region. So, it was comparing, so it was comparing low fat, low fat diet, diet, a classic boring low fat, boring low fat, diet, low fat diet, to a diet enriched with extra virgin olive oil or nuts. Or nuts. And, what we and what we found in the 7,000 uh, asymptomatic high risk elderly individuals within four years, 30% lower risk of heart attack and stroke. But more of interest really to I think this audience tonight that we saw regression of diabetes with high nut intake, only 30 grams a day actually, not very much, and 30 mils of olive oil, regression of diabetes, less new diabetes, but also at baseline better cognitive function if you had a Mediterranean type diet and less onset of new depression. So a Mediterranean diet rich in all these incredible polyphenols does help the mind both cognition and mood as well as prevent heart attacks and strokes. Unbelievably, almost too good to be believed but the science fits in with the population study. So four and a half years, slight modification of diet and we've got the runs of less heart attacks, less strokes, improved cognition and less depression. So it's almost too good to be true and better than any of the drugs that are around actually. 
That's great. Thank you, Dave. So we keep eating our nuts and some delicious Mediterranean food and we'll all be okay. That's nice to hear. Okay. So just back to me for a little bit of housekeeping, not too much because we want to get into it tonight. There's some ground rules that are up on your screen now. I'm sure everybody is aware of them, uh, abiding by uh, respectful conversations. Difference of opinion is really helpful, but obviously keep it constructive. Um, we also have a chat box that a panellist uh, sorry, participants can use in, to chat amongst each other, which can be really helpful as the webinar is going on. Um, we also have a questions tab for people who are joining us if they have questions that we can, I'll be looking at and collating to take to the panel later on in the webinar, which is always an interesting part to get uh, some feedback from those of you that are joining us tonight. If you have any technical support questions, there's an FAQ tab at the top of your screen. Um, and if you require support, there is a uh, Redback number there that you can contact. So hopefully we won't need any of that. Um, if there's a major issue, we'll let you know, but let's not jinx ourselves and get going. So what are we going to do tonight? We're going to go through, each of the panelists is going to present uh, briefly for about uh, the case study that you all read about Michael from their perspective as a practitioner. And then we're going to move through to some questions, as I said, and we'll bring it all together with some summaries at the end. So in terms of our learning outcomes for this evening, so hopefully by the end of the next hour or so, the webinar participants will be able to have an understanding and describe the complex bi-directional relationship between heart disease and mental health as well as the risk factors for and warning signs of heart disease in persons with psychiatric illness. Be able to describe the challenges, merits and opportunities and evidence-based approaches that are deemed most effective in treating and supporting people with heart disease related to mental health issues and also better target referrals for people experiencing mental health issues who are at risk of heart disease as a result of improved understanding of the role of different disciplines. So let's hope at the end of tonight we all um, have achieved those. So now I'm going to pass over to Helen and let her take the stage. So thank you, Helen. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. I, I think the case of Michael is very similar to many of my patients I look after in general practice. I think you know, he's, he, he sounds very familiar. Now when I look at through the, the vignette, there's some very encouraging features about Michael. I think it's great that he's employed part-time in a job that's physically active, stacking shelves. He's also connected to his sister who's providing stable housing and he's also been stable for 10 years and hasn't been hospitalised for 10 years. And he's got an ongoing relationship with his GP and psychiatrist. However, as a, as a GP, I'm very concerned about his cardiovascular risk. Using the calculator, I've, I, it's come out at 24%, i.e. Michael's got a one in four chance of a cardiovascular event in the next five years. And this event could be sudden, could be sudden death. And as a GP, I'd be very keen to do the new, the new Medicare heart health check on Michael, which is a 699, and this would enable me to calculate his risk and also do some lifestyle counselling. This can be done once a year. However, I'd like to do a whole lot more. Now, I would, I guess I'd like to do a whole lot more with Michael. I'd particularly like to improve his lifestyle and build a long-term therapeutic relationship with him. I'd be really keen for him to quit smoking. I'd be encouraging him to reshape his body by eating less energy, i.e. less sugar, less fat, and less alcohol and encouraging him to be more active and sit less and have more movement and 30 minutes of exercise five days per week. I'd also be getting him to drink more water and to of course avoid salt and I'd be wanting him to eat more, more fruit and vegetables and more nuts as David has described already and fish and olive oil and all, all the much better diet. I'd also be keen to treat his risk factors and I'd be considering medication for his cholesterol, his hypertension, his diabetes and also for his quitting smoking if he was, if he was indicated. Fortunately, I don't have to do this all by myself. I can, I'm lucky that there, there is a team approach 
approach, I'd be first of all really keen to talk to his psychiatrist because I'd be really wanting to, to tell him about the 24% cardiovascular risk and and his metabolic syndrome and his newly diagnosed diabetes and I'd be hoping that he might agree to stop the olanzapine or to use something else that was that was less metabolically harmful. I'd be also keen to work with his psychologist because I'd be wanting Michael to have any pos all the possible non-drug mood stabilising interventions that we could do. I'd be particularly thinking here about the sleep-wake cycle because we've because he's obviously been using the olanzapine to help with his sleep and we're going to have to have other strategies here when the olanzapine is stopped, if it's stopped. I'd also be keen, be keen to, for him to do some activity activation and get Michael more active. And also to explore with Michael what makes life meaningful for him and what are Michael's values. Now because Michael has diabetes, he's also eligible for a, a chronic disease management plan that I could do as a GP. And once that's done, he would be entitled to five Medicare funded sessions in a 12 month period. I'd be very keen to use three of those with the excellent diabetic educator who I work with, who was really able to get alongside people and help them with their lifestyle changes. I'd also be keen for him to see the podiatrist to check that he hasn't got any foot complications. However, it's also important to remember that in a newly diagnosed diabetic that we really must check their, check their eyes because diabetes is a leading cause of blindness and also their kidneys as well. And I'd also be hoping that at our local hospital I might be able to get him into a healthy lifestyle group or an exercise physiologist or or something like that as well. I think the key thing would be to go slow with him and to refer where Michael was interested. Now getting on to Michael's agenda, this may be entirely different to my agenda and I think this is where the art of general practice is, is, to, is, to, is, to, is to work out how you move on from two very different agendas. I'd be really keen to explore with Michael what does a rich full life look like for Michael? What does he value? Reading the vignette, it looks like it might be, he might value working, he might value his family, obviously his cars, maybe racing cars, maybe repairing cars, certainly watching motorsport is something he cares about. I'd also be keen to know how does he view his smoking and And I'd be keen to sort of assess whether he was ready to quit or not. But I'd be really wanting to work with Michael. And it would be a key thing would be to go on this lifestyle journey with, with Michael. We don't really have to fit, we can't fix it all in one consultation. This is clearly going to be worked out over over months. And I I'd like to view, I like the acceptance and commitment therapy view that Michael is stuck. He's not diseased, he's not broken, and he can become unstuck and lead a rich and meaningful life. And I also like to see, look at Michael has potential. He could go to school, he go back to school, he could study, he could get involved with his, with his lo local motor, motor museum. And the other great thing about Michael is his cardiovascular risk can be reduced. For example, if he quit smoking, it would be it would be halved. And I, and I think as a GP, it's also really important to reinforce his healthy behaviour and not reinforce his unhealthy behaviour. For example, I'd be really keen to praise him for being more active, and I'd be really keen to avoid prescribing sedatives to him, so that he that would just allow him to avoid life more and be more of a couch potato. I think Michael's also the sort of person who might not learn so well with, with just being talked at. But I think it'd be good to try and create some experiences with him in the consultation room that he can learn from. For example, I would like to get both of us to stand up and walk on the spot in the consultation to indicate to Michael that you know, sitting is harmful and you know, standing is better and just being, act, just being a little bit active 
is helpful. And I'd be trying to get him to work out where he could do that at home. And I was I'd be hoping that he might come up with it while he's watching his motorsport sport. He could be standing up and maybe walking. I'd also be keen to introduce the concepts of mindfulness to him and actually actually create some experiences with him. Now, but I'd be so pleased that I could work with the team. But I'd still be wanting to regularly review him for a long for long term management. I think the most important thing would be to also be very non-judgmental about Michael, accepting Michael as he is and encouraging him in these lifestyle changes. And I would enjoy working with him. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you, Helen. I really like that notion of the, the journey that you're going on together and that you're kind of partnering with Michael and working with him to help him move forward. Um, I think that's fantastic. So now we're going to take you over to Phil to get the uh, psychologist perspective. So I'll leave it to you, Phil. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. So I'll start, so I'll start section. my section out. There you go. Um, um, uh, by acknowledging that myself, a psychologist, along with other allied health professionals out there listening, we're not that we're not medically trained, trained but it is important to see Michael's case from, case from that medical perspective and one of heart disease prevention. Um, as this um, study, as this points, study out, points out, Michael's doing relatively well um, from his psychiatrist's report. And this is evidenced by not having any sort of acute self-harm attempts or manic episodes in the past 10 years. Um, and he's able to work part-time. So clearly Michael's cardiovascular risk is the main priority here. Although of course uh, there will be pertinent aspects of his psychological functioning that will come into play when we're trying to engage him in some behaviour change or change to his daily routine. So being a non-medical professional, some information I would want to gather, starting with the psychiatrist, um, he is of course taking a combination of uh, valproate and olanzapine, and we know that olanzapine is associated with weight gain and diabetes risk. And I'd want to clarify whether this augmentation strategy will remain in place in light of the recent weight gain and HbA1c and a potential medication change was already flagged by Helen, um, the GP. And so it's important to know um, as a change or switch in medication could be associated with an increase in self-harm, behaviours, mania and depression. So considering the possible medication changes, I'd want to know from the psychiatrist whether and what um, early monitoring of warning signs is in place um, and work with the psychiatrist to ensure that there's consistency in risk factor monitoring and um, of sleep and activity symptoms, moods and mania for mania prevention. Uh, and also in, in saying this, keep in mind that a, a, a medication switch, it might not be an ideal time point to engage in psychotherapy with Michael um, and it might be best to wait until the regimen is stabilised. Now to the GP uh, from yeah, say out in the real world, assuming Helen isn't just simply a, a online chat away. I'd want to know um, from her. It seems that some of his risk factors are quite urgent, and and they might require some treatment. So I'd want to um, get a sense from the GP if this is being approached through. Um, having an antihypertensive, a statin for cholesterol and insulin for diabetes. And I'd want to know if there's going to be lifestyle medications put in place to um, go alongside those medications. And importantly, whether Michael is actually supported to do those lifestyle changes. So some conditions like diabetes typically have a uh, chronic care team associated with it to help people manage. Um, and so this, along with the other risk factors, Michael might be feeling uh, a bit overwhelmed here, having so many risk factors and having to make multiple lifestyle changes. So I could work with the GP to help support um, any of Michael's emotional needs in this time of change and risk factor management. Otherwise, uh, the GP has suggested modelling some physical activity behaviours. And it would be important to assist the GP to provide some structure in Michael's life 
for him to implement those and sustain behavioural change such as physical activity. And now to the cardiologist, what I'd want to know um, were there several aspects of his cardiac functioning that could be important, whether he has a degree of atherosclerosis, cardiomyopathy, the results of his echocardiography or ECG. But another piece of the puzzle that would be important is to get a sense of the likelihood um, that Michael will be experiencing somatic symptoms that could actually be part of cardiovascular disease. Um, and not to do with depression. And examples of where those symptoms overlap could be feeling easily fatigued, feeling flat, having inertia and low energy. And it's important to emphasize here that we don't want to pathologize those symptoms that might be experienced as part of the chronic disease. So gathering this information would get a sense of the severity of cardiac risk and how urgent risk factor reduction is. And again, Michael, I suspect, will be feeling quite overwhelmed with this um, and about hearing his chances of developing heart disease or a stroke. And he might need some emotional support and working on some basic um, coping strategies. So why am I telling you all this? Well, there's a very good reason that I went to great lengths to explain um, getting that um, range of information from the different clinicians. Um, and people responsible for Michael's care. And that's because one of the best approaches to severe mental illness comorbid with chronic physical conditions, such as cardiovascular disease or diabetes, is a collaborative care approach. Uh, it goes by other names, such as integrated care or collaborative care. Now, it's important to understand that historically, the treatment of mental health and chronic disease, such as cardiovascular disease, was often quite independent of each other. But this neglects the complexity of both mental health and cardiovascular risk um, and the needs and the importance of how those risk factors are controlled um, together in their management. So what we're seeing in, in practice and certainly in the literature supports that is a shift away from this unitary approach of doing CBT on its own um, in favour of a more coordinated approach between different stakeholders involved in um, mental and physical health care. Now, my experience with cardiologists has shown that they're more than happy to receive uh, letters and updates about their patients' mental health treatment. So I'd encourage the listeners out there to continually communicate with GPs, psychiatrists, but also cardiologists, um, because some of the work that's done in psychotherapy um, can help with chronic disease management. Now on to the first consultation and what we'd want to know from Michael. Well, I think the, the questioning and structure would be very similar to what clinicians listening in do in their normal uh, daily practice. However, one unique aspect that I'd want to ask questions about is what Michael thinks about cardiovascular disease and its risk factors. It's especially important here to explore Michael's understanding uh, and insight of his uh, vascular disease risk. Going forward in future sessions, it will be important to get a sense of his appraisal of this um, and his preparedness for change in terms of lifestyle risk factors. I'd be asking some pretty basic questions, as you would in bipolar, about his mood. As I mentioned, he might be overwhelmed emotionally, and it be prudent to get a sense of how he's coping and what strategies he has in place. Other standard aspects related to bipolar should be covered, such as irritability. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, what uh, early warning signs um, and mania prevention is in place. It'd be important um, to consider what is remembered from his time being treated by a psychiatrist over 10 years. As always, with uh, patients with such severe um, mental illness, consider underreporting of alcohol and substance use. So importantly, I think it's it's worth uh, working on some agreed upon treatment goals. Um, in Michael's case, his cardiovascular behaviours and risk, um, 
seem to be more important than his psychiatric needs. So the, the diagram is slightly tilted to, towards cardiovascular risk. That's on screen now. Um, and it, from Michael's perspective, he might find it um, unusual to see a psychologist about his physical health. So it'd be important to um, be putting that in context for him about why it's important to get both aspects of his life in order and to ensure that Michael is likely to come back to the next session. I'd like to leave him with something tangible, uh, feeling hopeful, motivated, whether that's leaving with a cardio, um, a clear homework task. Uh, it could be a refresher task on his uh, warning signs and relapse prevention um, or mania, monitoring a review of his mood strategies. And if the first session is going particularly well, might include listening pros and cons of some of his behaviours that have uh, adverse health consequences, such as um, his alcohol intake. So I've put this next slide in, it's really about evidence-based approaches, and the listeners might feel uh, reassured that a broader approach could be taken for Michael, um, depending on which alliance, whether you have alliances with certain strategies or you prefer one over the other. And um, this is good news out there for the listeners. Um, I must point out amongst all those on screen, so we have CBT, integrated cognitive interpersonal therapy, family focus, social rhythm, CBT and mindfulness. With the latter, there's generally only evidence uh, for people that are euthymic, that is uh, not in a sense of the state of mania um, when entering therapy. So there's merits for all of those aforementioned pro approaches and I just re-emphasise here that please ensure sleep, activity, self-harm, suicide risk and early warning side monitoring is in place regardless of what approach is taken. Now the next slide, I've got two potential directions uh, based on interpersonal and social rhythm therapy as well as CBT. So the interpersonal and social rhythm therapy approach might take the angle of Michael's current transitions and adjustment to having a chronic disease. The social rhythm aspect of this approach, it would be important to implement routine and structure in his daily life concerning his social life, work, exercise and sleep and continued monitoring of all these aspects. Motivational interviewing is wedged in between the two approaches and I, I believe it could be drawn upon um, in both. And a motivational interviewing approach might be assessing his preparedness for change, um, and whether identifying any barriers to behaviour change that are in his current life. It would be important to promote self-efficacy for him to implement any change and maintain adherence such as to exercise, diet and general disease self-management. Now for the CBT approach, which again could include motivational interviewing, I would uh, suspect Michael would need assistance with his distress tolerance and adjustment, his prior major depressive episodes, raise some questions about what, um, what basic coping strategies he has in place, and a related point uh, to adjustment in general with the cardiovascular patients I work with is on disease-related um, cognitions. It's important to work with reappraisals of these uh, and what can be overly pessimistic and sometimes um, overly optimistic. And just finally, I'll put some potential barriers on screen. And the first one is that progress can be slow and that's okay. There's certain aspects um, inherent to bipolar uh, that um, could be potential barriers such as increase in goal-focused activity and this could include any homework tasks it's important to note that he has a history of non-adherence and that will be important because his non-adherence in the past has resulted in uh, hospitalisations. 
So that needs to be bear in mind and we wouldn't want to give him the impression his new medications are the sole reason for his cardiovascular risk. And I'll finish up there and hand it back to Nicola. Thank you, Phil. That was fantastic. I think it's really helpful for people to see both ends of the spectrum in that that specialised knowledge or knowing what to ask the other specialised members of the care team what, as a psychologist need to be aware of, but also coming back. Uh, it was reassuring for me to think that actually when you're working with someone like Michael that knowledge around CBT or motivational interviewing could also is actually what we would go to with sites as well. So um, that was really helpful, thank you. We had a couple of questions just quickly around um, our Michael that we're talking about. Um, Michael has been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. So just to clarify that for our audience, I'm sorry that we hadn't um, made that clear. Um, we've almost got 600 online, uh, which is fantastic. So I hope you're all sticking with us. And now I'm excited to take us through to our cardiologist. Um, so over to you, David. Well, thank you, thank you Nicola. Uh, and um, thank you, Helen and Phil. Um, as Helen said, this is this chappy. Only 46 is the ticking time bomb. And Helen's estimate, estimate, estimate of his risk of a cardiovascular event, a heart attack, stroke, or just simply not waking up in the morning is around 24%. It would be at least 24%, and no wonder Phil said, I'm tilting towards cardiovascular risk as his major problem. Now, it's fortunate that I'm a cardiologist, and we have so many tools in our kit these days to dramatically decrease his risk of cardiovascular disease with lifestyle measures proven to work, with drugs proven to work, which does not upset his mental illness. In fact, We've got a lot to do heart-wise to keep him on Mother Earth and make him feel better. Let's look at this chappy. 46, high morbidity is associated with severe mental illness, whether it is uh, from severe depression, schizophrenia, post-traumatic stress disorder, isolation. As a heart foundation, I've been lucky to be part of a number of groups where we've looked at this in cardiovascular risk. And in Australia, we lead the world. We lead the world in our recommendations for screening and treating from the cardiology point of view. We are way in front of the Europeans, way in front of Americans, and we were 10 years ahead of the American Heart Association. This chappy, his risk is heart attack, stroke, and sudden death, about a third, a third, a third. By definition, one in four chance at least of dropping dead or having a stroke or heart attack, and it is largely preventable. His risk, I've got down here, is greater than the 74-year-old. Um, well, there's 130 risk factors that, in, that impinge on your heart arteries to cause atherosclerosis. Psychosocial factors are as important as the classic biological factors. Now, the next slide. Go the next slide, thanks. Yeah, if we look at the, oh, no, go back one. The Australian Risk Calculator, it is based on data from North America and then truncated over five years. We've got here 21%, well, on 24%, doesn't matter. A one in four chance, at least, of a heart attack, stroke, or sudden cardiac death. This is, is an immediate problem, or from the cardiac point of view, uh, which uh, will lead to catastrophe and worsen his mental illness. Next slide. We want to look at another way and we go to the Australian Risk Calculator. By the way, everyone can go to the Heart Foundation's website and look at the papers we have generated about screening, treating of depression and psychosocial factors. This is the latest looking at heart age, which is very powerful and extremely popular. This is the latest. You can say to this chappy, you might be 46, but you, your heart age, your biological age is 67. Look upon it that way but we can make you a 46-year-old again. We can make you even less than that by a few simple things in your lifestyle, a few simple medications. Next slide. Now, this is some of the expected benefit from treatment. We've got from the top cat channel there for every one millimole reduction of LDL, and these days, your doctor, doesn't have to be a cardiologist, is not trying unless they get two millimole reductions. So just simply lowering the LDL in this chap. 
can decrease his risk easily by 50%, 24%, 12%. Really simple with medication in more than 95% of people does not cause any symptoms whatsoever. So you can have one tablet, two drugs, and you can get there. Blood pressure or 10 millimetres of mercury systolic, another 10% reduction of cardiovascular disease. Diet, I've already mentioned the Mediterranean diet, 30 grams of nuts. You know when you're in the hotel and you've got that little packet, that's 50. 30 grams of nuts or 30, or actually 30 mils of extra virgin olive oil, each independently decreases the risk of heart disease. It makes your salad taste better and what a good snack to have with your glass of wine, which is also part of the Mediterranean diet, you can decrease the risk easily. Going for a walk most days, really simple. For people with mild to moderate depression, going for a walk half an hour most days is as good, sorry Phil, cognitive behavioural therapy, and as good as your sertraline, the, major, the most commonly used drugs. And together they're additive. They're additive, go for a walk. Decreases risk of heart attack and improves low mood. The pre uh, for diabetes, we now have at last a medication which has taken diabetes for since 1922, an SGLT inhibitor. Weight loss, unfortunately, does not, has a very poor track record of de decreasing cardiovascular events. Health ministers may focus on it. Your Dolly, your you know, Woman's Weekly, but that's not science. Unfortunately, it's not useful and people fail losing weight and they get more depressed and anxious. Let's focus on these things that work. Next slide. We'll move to the next slide. So here is just an example of just on the classic risk calculator. And remember, everyone can go to Heart Foundation. Everyone can download it. Please do it. So just a few simple measures. We can easily drop his risk dramatically. And as Helen said, stop smoking. It's easier said than done, but if you can do that, fantastic. Next slide. Now, these are basic investigations. Obviously, examination history. That sounds basic, but many doctors don't bother taking history. Many don't examine the patients because it's so poorly paid general practice. But let me tell you, in the United Kingdom particularly, and we looked at the English in the past we have, it's very rare for patients to have a stethoscope put on their chest. ECG, very important. These are the important standard blood tests. For people with low mood, look at the thyroid, look at the B12, look at the iron. This is one of the great sleepers. Low total body iron, a ferritin less than 100, can play a major role in poor cognitive function and low mood or depression. And 60% when you fix patients up with an iron infusion feel dramatically better within a couple of days. The advanced imaging, which is now part and parcel of really knowing whether the patient has got a high risk. Cardiac calcium score, an x-ray, it's a CT scan, and what we know with this, it costs about, um, uh, only costs about $150. 50% of people have high risk or low risk. So here we have in the heart foundation position statement, depression, major risk factor, social isolation, absolutely no question about it, independent, and it's similar to conventional risk factors, uh, and after you've had your first heart attack as well as the second. Next one. Next slide, that'll be good. Next one. And there we have a number of other, so it's not just depression. And recently, uh, two years ago, Ralph Stewart from New Zealand and I published the Persistent Perceived Stress in our Australian lipid trial doubles the risk of mortality over 12 years independent of anything else. So if someone feels distressed on multiple occasions and feel this is bad for the heart, they're absolutely correct. Next slide. Next one. Yes, here we go. So the Heart Foundation recommendations uh, for treatment of depression, uh, exercise most days, as we said, cognitive behavioral therapy, other therapy. Many of our patients have complementary therapies where there is some data so the omega-3 fatty acids, the fish oil, the St. John's wort and SAMe can be effective. There's some data of that, but many of our patients take it. And the drugs for, uh, that we believe has got the safest track record is sertraline, loxetine, et cetera, et cetera here. 
But avoid tricyclics. There's evidence that that increases the risk of cardiomyopathy in sudden cardiac death. I think we're probably just about to the end. That's from a cardiologist's point of view. And is that the next one now, or we're 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 done for the moment? We are. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic, David. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for reminding me of Dolly. <laughs> I haven't heard about thought about that magazine for a long time. I feel like reading Dolly with a Mars bar, but maybe I should have been having a, a Mediterranean salad with olive oil instead and I'd be better off. Um, I want to thank all the panellists so far. That was a fascinating and really uh, lively uh, discussion from all of your perspectives and I think uh, the audience will really benefit from getting that triangulation of the views, but lots of consistency as well. So. Now we move into the interesting part where we get the audience's questions answered, hopefully. So what we will do we, is we get the questions coming through from the audience. We also have some too that were sent through before the webinar from the audience. So if it's okay with you, Helen, I might start with you with a question. Yes. So Helen, Thank you, Nicola. We haven't got a, a psychiatrist on the panel this evening. Um, we would obviously all of you have mentioned them in the care team. However, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to what a psychiatrist's role could be in terms of assisting with prevention of uh, cardiovascular heart disease and working with someone like Michael. Well, I think his psychiatrist could be really useful by reviewing the medication that he's on. He's on. Olanzapine and and also uh, Valparate. Both of these are known to cause weight gain, and Olanzapine is the second worst drug for causing metabolic syndrome in all the antipsychotics. Clozapin is the only thing that's worse. So, I mean, I'd be really keen for the psychiatrist to really review his medications. Okay, fantastic. Um, I was got a question maybe for uh, Phil, if you're re you're ready for me to throw to you. This is one from the audience, so not necessarily one uh, we've talked about before. But could, I was wondering if you could give some tips on the best way to set up the collaborative approach that you spoke about with other health professionals and how that can be maintained in an ongoing way. Yeah, excellent question. I, I think. People out there working in community mental health um, would certainly be working within a collaborative system already, um, but those in private practice might not have such a luxury. Um, I feel like um, perhaps writing letters with, with just some of that information that's required, some questions uh, to the GP psychiatrist and cardiologist is a good starting point and you might be surprised at how engaged uh, the different stakeholders or clinicians are in in the patient's welfare. So just I think getting that response and um, really an update of where a patient is at from the different clinicians is a really good starting point. You might become more familiar with certain clinicians over time if you're receiving referrals from a certain GP clinic or um, certainly in the past I've had the luxury of working closely with certain cardiologists across a number of different hospitals um, which helps um, get cardiologists on board if, if they're part of the process of identifying patients that need care, but generally just an open communication I, I would think is the best starting point and it might not always work, but see what you get back. Fantastic. Thank you, Phil. Um, I, I think um, that's a really important message. I think in psychology land we're used to sending letters back and forth perhaps um, in just more of an operational way, but really uh, kind of bringing in that collaborative team, I think when people are aware that you're keen to do that, that can um, have great results for the, the clients that we're working with. So that, that's fantastic. Now, audience members, if you've got any other questions, please feel free to send them through to us. We'd love to answer them as we go through. We've still got a bit of time, which is fantastic, to answer your questions. 
But while we're waiting for some more questions to come through, I've got one here for you, David, if you're uh, up for it, which I'm sure you are. We've talked a lot about drugs and medication this evening and the, the benefits and uh, otherwise of different medications for someone like Michael. I was wondering, do any cardiovascular drugs have side effects on mental health conditions and vice versa? Um, do cardiovascular drugs have effects on mood symptoms? Yeah, well, there's been a lot of confusion over the years, partly because of the internet and Dr. Google. Um, the science is this. Beta blockers can give some symptoms which can be confused. Beta blockers are a very common drug we use to slow the heart rate down post heart attack. Beta blockers, however, can make people feel a bit tired, can have in, uh, influenced dreams, but they do not cause depression. Um, Drugs that we use, do they cause depression or anxiety? Um, the long and the short of it is, no, they don't. Statins, the most effective drugs ever in the history of medicine, people attribute, about 20% attribute some of their funny side effects, tiredness, fatigue and low mood to statins. But when we truly give blinded testing, when people don't know whether they're on it or not, it's less than 5% does not cause mood changes, and more importantly, it's minor aches and pains. What we do know is that, and we did one of, one of the uh, most important studies in our Australian lipid trial, and that's why we measured uh, anxiety uh, and uh, general uh, feeling of unwellness and, and depression at the beginning, multiple time points, and at the end, the people thought lowering cholesterol per se and statins in particular may precipitate depression. Short answer is, does not have any effect on incident depression uh, and severity of depression, nor new onset. And more importantly, statins prevent cognitive decline. They don't cause uh, impaired cognition, except in rare idiosyncratic uh, circumstances, which is about one in a thousand. So now our drugs don't cause mood problems. Uh, and more importantly, we keep people alive who would otherwise not be here. I think that's probably the short answer. That's fantastic. And, oh, sorry, omega-3 fatty mm -hmm. acids actually improve mood. So that's what all our patients should be on that. Sorry. Wonderful. That's great. Thank you very much, David. Um, Helen, I have a question for you, if that's okay. Um, in your conversation, we were talking about you were talking about working on the journey. With, with Michael and uh, kind of continuing along and uh, Phil touched on it as well in terms of, um, I can imagine in a consult with my, Michael that it could be quite overwhelming for him looking down at the kind of barrel of uh, the diagnosis of physical and mental health conditions that he's experiencing. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you might approach the steps, where, where you would start and how you would know where to start and. Um, would you be scheduling reg regular appointments with Helen uh, with uh, Michael? Sorry, how would you approach that? Uh, thank you, Nicola. That's an excellent question. I, I, I think the important thing would be to schedule regular appointments with him. Somebody like Michael, I'd, I'd love to book out a half an hour for him once a once a month and really go slowly through lifestyle things at his rate and do it according to what he's what he's interested in. And, and also to try and build up his up his self self esteem and praise him when he does take just small small steps. But I think it's you know you, you probably won't see much progress over one or two consultations, but over over a two or three year period, I think you may see considerable progress. And particularly if we can all, all, all remember that Michael's you know Michael's got a lot of potential, and Fantastic. and he can change his. And he can reduce his cardiovascular risk with these simple lifestyle changes. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Helen. Um, David, just a quick question back to you. I think I maybe cut over you or um, in the last medication that you mentioned. Was it fatty acids? Um, so, yeah, with this chappy, I just focus in. The simplest thing to Harvey's risk is to give him a combination of statin and azetamide. And if you want to keep the pill count down, I will put him on a combination of Lipitor and Ezetrel. That will lower his LDL by more than two millimoles per liter and halve his risk, even if he stops, continues smoking, even if he doesn't want to exercise. So 
that's really simple thing to do and I would encourage him. Um, but sorry, what was the other question? What would I also do? No, so that, that was just a clarification of the last medication that you mentioned in your last question. I think it was, there may have been fatty acids that you mentioned towards the end. Uh, well, the, I mentioned beta blockers uh, as the medication yeah. that gives yeah. symptoms of tiredness and fatigue. And a number of people over the years, be it cardiologists and non-cardiologists, jump on, oh, that tablet has caused depression. It doesn't cause depression, it causes tiredness and fatigue and vivid dreams. But interestingly, you know, some people have had these terrible dreams for years and they given all sorts of medications just stop the beta blocker. It's called metoprolol, uh, atenolol. Um, they're the two common ones that are used. And many people do not need to be on these tablets. I mean, one of the problems with doctors in general, we seem to be afraid to de prescribe. It's not a problem giving people a, I like to call it a drug holiday. It's a really cheap holiday, simple holiday, and you might feel better than going to Hayman Island. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I've got you there, David. I've got a question from Jose who asks, can you, I think this was your point, can you elaborate on why weight loss doesn't contribute to improved cardiovascular health? And secondly, is there any research in the future around the role of a diet rich in plant-based foods given what we know about studies like the China study. You willing yeah, well, to take that one on Dave? Yeah sure. Um, I mean I've been involved in this, interested in this area since the 1970s so that's why I've got grey hair but you know <laughs> I'm still around because of my fish oil. Now just getting back to plant-based food, in other words vegetarian type food. We have known since the early 1950s, in fact 1952, a vegetarian type food, in the, as in the traditional Mediterranean diet of Crete, is associated with low risk of heart attacks and strokes. We know that. But you can have very unhealthy vegetarian food, as in India. I was there uh, invited to talk on prevention of coronary disease at the Cardiological Society last year. Half the population is vegetarian, but their rates of heart attack and stroke, officially, it's officially, they're underestimated, is 30 to 50% above what it is in Australia. So you can have an unhealthy vegetarian diet. But within the pre-med diet that I mentioned, 7,000 Spaniards follow for four and a half years, those, whether or not you're on the low-fat diet, the uh, Mediterranean two diets, olive oil or nuts, lower rates of heart attacks and strokes with a vegetarian type diet. But, but fish is positively healthy. So if you're a pescatarian, that's even better. So vegetarian, like in Spain, like in southern Italy, like in Greece, and I suspect Jose knows what I'm talking about, um, are very, very healthy. Now, the Mediterranean diet is enriched with foods from South America, such as avocado, very healthy, similar benefits. Um, nuts, such as peanuts, of course, they, they, don't, they don't come from, uh, they come from, again, South America. So I think that's the... Uh, about the plant-based diet. Yes, are there? Uh, there's plenty of studies. Intervention. There's only been two really well-done trials comparing a low-fat diet to a Mediterranean diet after a heart attack or not a heart attack. And that's the other one, the Leon diet trial. The runs are on the board, and and it fits in with the epidemiological data looking at looking at populations. There is no question about it. A Mediterranean type diet which is basically vegetarian and fish and some meat occasionally, often from goat traditionally, is the best examined diet for prevention of heart attack, stroke, low depression, and improved survival and less uh, cancers of some sort. Uh, the China thing, I think you're talking about a epidemiological study, um, most relevant to people living in Australia is the Mediterranean type diet. And a Mediterranean type diet has been looked at in the United States, and that's been associated in 130,000 nurses for 25 years, a 30% lower rate of heart disease than a classic American diet. So I might just stop there, but um, the data is fairly, well, I'm not going to say overwhelming, but it's as good as anything we have in medicine. That's great. Thank you so much. Got some great questions coming in. I might throw to you, Phil, um, to take one from a Michael in our audience. Um, and Michael asked, what does psychoeducation look like for Michael around needed lifestyle changes and behavioural uh, 
activation, I suppose, from your perspective? Yeah, I, I think there would, firstly, there needs to be a balance, um, being that he's bipolar. Uh, we can't have too little, but we certainly can't have too much. We don't want to uh, increase the physical activity to the point that we induce mania. So we need to start light and um, psychoeducation on physical activity would be around the importance of it just for his general cardiovascular risk. We would try and reiterate the messages from the GP and that Helen has said at their um, increasing and in, in modelling activity. Now, I think in this particular case, uh, someone who's a car enthusiast, there could be some um, potential resistance there. So it might be uh, worth, when talking about the merits of physical activity, to discuss some potential incidental exercise, such as walking to work one day a week or riding a bicycle, and, then, and try and um, distinguish between what's sort of overt cardiovascular um, or sort of really high intensity exercise versus just some gentle walking for half an hour a day um, and incorporating that into his routine. And I would also consider um, discussing with a case such as Michael about just the general benefit to mood. Um, there could be social aspects as well. The National Heart Foundation run walking groups, so we might be um, eligible to participate in one of those, make some new friendships. Um, but I, I think really, it's about balancing what is essentially a really urgent need. I think like Helen and David have discussed how severe his risk is. So some physical exercise is incredibly important, but we'd need to start quite gently for him and try and getting him in a routine. Um, one that he sees as beneficial to himself, to his long-term longevity and potentially discuss some of those associated benefits that might include the socialisation aspect by participating in a walking group. That's great. Thank you, Phil. I think you make a really good point about linking whenever we're, we're wanting people to change their lifestyle. It's, um, I think, often much more, but more likely that they're going to engage in it if we show some interest and insight into what they're interested in and link it to that rather than setting really unrealistic goals that they feel that they're going to fail at. So, yeah, that was, that was great. Thank you. Now, Helen, I've got a question for you. Um, Anna asks, as a psychiatrist, I see a lot of patients who are not well linked with GPs and getting them to a GP or specialist can be difficult. Could you please offer some guidelines about how to best manage the metabolically complex patient? And is there a possibility to have secondary consults with GPs and or cardiologists? Uh, thank you. That's an excellent quest question. I, I think one of the key things in general practice is if somebody can actually actually keep going to see the same GP. It's not it's not always easy, but I think some clinics are probably better at maintaining that continuity than than others, and I think that really helps with the lifestyle journey. And and I, and I think we've just got to keep on, you know, measuring, measuring, measuring cholesterol, and liver and liver function and electrolytes, and doing all those those blood tests regularly, and keep up with the lifestyle counselling, and then prescribing the the statins as as needed. And certainly, you know, the results of the statins are really quite exciting when you do see somebody's cholesterol go from from Six down to 4.5. It really, you know, it really is, is very, very exciting, and the, and the patient is is very excited too. So I think it's I think it's a matter of of keeping on on with on, on with just just persevering with with those changes and keep on measuring them. And I think what's important is that all members of the team, if all members of the team are on the same page length, and all members of the team are interested in in not only the psychiatric illness but also 
how how Michael is, is surviving heart wise and metabolically as well. Thank you. And Helen, so in your experience it sounds like uh, GPs such as yourself who have an interest in this would be open to secondary consult from other psychiatrists or other practitioners working with someone like Michael? Yes, I think I think we we, we would be. Yeah. And Great. I think that's also what, what one thing where we're having Skype consultations with psychiatrists can you know, and the patient can be very useful. Right. Now I have a fascinating question which I want to know the answer to. I'm not sure who in the panel is going to put their hand up to answer it. So I'll throw it out there and first in best dress. So this is from Elizabeth and Elizabeth says, what I'd like to know is, is someone considered at risk after one episode of major depression, two episodes, three episodes, etc.? So ultimately, does heart disease risk increase after one episode of major depression and then increase further with continuing episodes of depression? So is there a, a graded risk, I suppose, with, with ongoing um, episodes? Who's happy to take that one? I imagine maybe David or Helen. Yep, go for it, David. Well, we reviewed this on two occasions at the Heart Foundation in terms of the cardiovascular risk. Um, first publication was uh, 15 years ago and then 10 years ago. The short answer is, when you say someone's had an episode of depression, as the psychiatrist in our group pointed out, many people have never had resolution of their depression. Um, and we do know there, uh, that, that that might be the, the signature uh, depression, but we know severity of depression, like any other risk factor and chronicity, uh, uh, acts to increase cardiovascular risk. So, um, so we reviewed the data. We're quite happy with that. One episode that you know of increases your risk, but it's probably not the only episode. So maybe I'll hand over to uh, everybody else on that one. Anybody else want to buy into that one? Helen, do you have anything to add on that or Phil? Uh, I can jump in. Yeah, just, Great. Uh, clarify, um, I guess it's important to not just concentrate on depression, that some of the risk of heart disease is a range of um, psychiatric disorders, PTSD, um, there's a controversial link with panic disorder, um, major depression, unipolar, bipolar and psychosis. So I think that there's definitely a graded exposure for the longer um, more persistent um, the duration of illness, the more likely that there would be changes to the autonomic functioning of the heart, atherosclerosis, inflammatory processes. Um, but let's keep in mind that uh, a large proportion of that risk is attributable to behavioural um, and socioeconomic aspects, some things people can't actually change, um, such as their social status, their race but also um, behaviours such as smoking, um, alcohol intake and physical activity. So in short, I would reassure the person that's asked this question that one episode of two weeks of major depression would not significantly increase your cardiovascular risk. Fantastic. Thank you, Phil. And what, that was fantastic. Those questions that came through, I, I, I was fascinated to hear those answers. So thank you so much for panellists for sending them through. I've got a few more minutes. We're going to go around and wrap up with our panellists. I've got one very quick question for you, David. Does it matter what type of nut? Uh, well, yeah, we reviewed this um, uh, again in our research. Uh, the, the short answer is nuts, put aside coconut because of its very high saturated fat, um, nuts that are associated with low rates of heart disease, five large epidemiological studies. It doesn't seem to matter whether it's almond, macadamia nuts, peanuts, they're not really nuts, but they count as well, they're legumes. But lower rates of heart disease, a handful per day, or a handful a few times a week is even better than none at all. So um, walnuts, almonds, uh, cashews, all the nuts we like. Coconut a little bit for flavour is okay. But can I just add as well, um, in the epidemiological studies looking at depression, if one had had a one diagnosis of depression, that increased the risk over time epidemiologically. 
Bill's right. If they truly had 100% depression and were totally recovered, well, probably it, it wouldn't have an effect. But even substitutional, you're not made depressive order, has epidemiologically increased risk. Thank you, David. Okay, so now we get to wrap up. So I'm going to throw to each of our panellists in turn and I was wondering if you could just leave us with a take-home message or a key point that um, maybe you haven't covered yet that you wanted to, to get in before we finish. So, Helen, we'll start with you. Have you got a, a wrap-up message for our attendees today? I think you might be muted, Helen. We might need you to... Sorry. Sorry. That's it. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you, Nicola. I think one... I think one key thing for us is to also consider self-care because we, we, also, we all need to do self-care and that also involves self-care of our cardiovascular risk factors because we're not immune from, from heart disease, we can also suffer from it. And I think also if, if we look after our own cardiovascular risk factors then we're much, more, much better at being able to go on a lifestyle journey with our patients and helping them. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Helen. How about you, Phil? Have you got a message to leave us all with for tonight? Yeah, uh, thanks, Nicola. Um, I, I think the main message is that sometimes psychologists and us mental health professionals might see ourselves as uh, exclusively working with mental health. And, and in a scenario such as this case, we can work towards improving someone's physical health. Um, and there's a sense of urgency with this with this case, and and that would apply whether someone is at risk of disease or actually has um, heart disease. We can contribute in both of those scenarios as a psychologist to improve someone's cardiovascular uh, risk and outcomes. Great, thank you, Phil. And over to you, David. To well, I think I'm just going to come in. Yeah, well, I think this has been a fantastic forum, and I wish everybody was uh, living around where I work. Um, that I, I think it's a great opportunity. These, this patient and many of your patients are at high risk, and they are not a trouble. They are an opportunity. We can do something to make them live longer and in a healthy fashion. So everyone, it's our duty to do the best for our patients. Everybody, I don't care who you are, please do the risk calculator. And then if it comes up more than 5%, write a referral to the GP, to everybody, cardiologist. This patient is at high risk and we need to further assess them, put down the blood test and consider getting into this century with a cardiac calcium score. It's like the mammogram of the heart. Remember, five times as many women die of heart disease than uh, breast cancer. And our chappy here, he's at very high risk, but we can do something about it today and he will be your patient, uh, a, a grateful patient when you make him feel better and live longer. It's everyone's uh, responsibility, not just the GP, not just the cardiologist, all the psychologists and other people out there. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you, David. And I think that's a, a beautiful message for us to, to wrap up on, which is these People that we work with are, are, are not a problem, they're an opportunity. I think that's a lovely uh, sentiment and I think it's one that we can all um, carry with us. Particularly, we can feel daunted, I think, working with clients with complex needs and feel daunted for them uh, in terms of what they're facing. So I think approaching it with that positivity and a fantastic evidence base behind what we do, uh, we can feel confident that we can help, help Michael on this journey to recovery. So I want to thank all of you so much. I've learned a lot tonight. Um, and I really want to encourage people who have come along tonight to listen to look at additional resources that we will provide for you at the end of this session. I also want to encourage people to complete the exit survey at the end of this webinar. It is really helpful feedback. Um, it gets read, I assure you, and it helps to shape future webinars and content so you, we can make sure that MHPN are providing you with the content that is relevant to your workplace uh, and make sure that we keep improving. So please don't forget to fill it out. It only takes a couple of minutes. 
Um, so the next webinar, just to let everybody know, will be on collaborating to recognise and address depression in cannabis users on Wednesday the 17th of July. So again, a really interesting topic um, and trying to disentangle some complex behaviours and um, mood issues with, with people that we're working with. So finally, the mental health, uh, MHPN supports the engagement and ongoing maintenance of practitioner networks where clinicians from different disciplines meet regularly together uh, with mental health practitioners to share tips and resources, build local referral pathways and engage in CPT activities. So to learn more about the, your local practitioner networks, so these national ones, but there's also ones in your community, please contact MHPN or go to the news section of the website. Um, if you're interested in joining in a network over the next couple of weeks, those of you that are having some breaks for school holidays maybe, have a look at the website. Um, but before I close and thank all of our panellists once more for joining us tonight and all our attendees, I'd like to acknowledge the consumers and carers who have lived with mental Ill illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. And I want to thank everybody for your participation this evening and I wish you all a good evening. Thanks and good night. Bye, Nicola. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.